Today's book is English Phonetics and Phonology, a practical course by Peter Roach, 4th edition. Now, just because I would hate for anyone to waste their time unnecessarily, let me just say right at the very beginning, I don't have anything intelligent to say about this book, as insofar as the content. No, let me... I don't have anything intelligent to say, period. Uh, I'm going to just kind of talk about my experience reading it, um, but I've, I know some people sometimes click on these videos expecting kind of more concrete information. Let me just save you the trouble and be clear about this at the front. I don't have anything intelligent to say. Uh, I, yeah, I'm just gonna talk about my experience reading this book. So, my experience reading this book. Uh, this book I bought all the way back in 2010. I was in graduate, sc uh, graduate school at the time. I was doing a course in applied linguistics, which was kind of meant for language teachers like myself, people who had been teaching English abroad for several years. And uh, took a course in phonetics and phonology and this was one of the required books on the course, so I bought it at the university bookstore. I have, if anyone's interested, just for interest's sake, this is the other book that was required reading on the course, A Course in Phonetics by Peter Ladefoguede. Ladefoguede? I don't know. Anyways, I'm not going to talk about this book today, but just in case anyone's interested in what the other book was. So, uh, this book was assigned reading for the, for the course, uh, although the professor were kind of, she didn't tailor the syllabus of her course to fit this book. Rather, uh, you know, as I think a lot of these university professors do, she arranged the readings from this book to follow her syllabus. Uh, so, you know, uh, I don't even remember which order we read these chapters in, but they were assigned all out of order. I did my best to keep up with the readings uh, in graduate school, but um, yeah, I struggled. Uh, this is somewhat a different subject, maybe, for a different post, but uh, it's difficult keeping up with all the readings in graduate school. I think the, the professors assign you much more than you can possibly read in one week, and they know it, and you're kind of intended to kind of read some stuff carefully, kind of skim the rest of it, uh, and like not read some of it, like I don't, some of it's just on the syllabus, just to round it off, I don't know. But like, I don't know, I had a terrible time doing that. I've got a certain personality type, I wanted to read everything. So the first week I tried to read everything, and then every subsequent week I was just stressed out and had a hard time keeping up. And I just had trouble kind of doing the time management that you have in graduate school. Uh, and also just kind of trouble handling the stress of it. You know, I get kind of so stressed out that I couldn't concentrate on the reading. But all that being said, I did actually read a lot of this book. I didn't read the whole thing. I'm not even sure the whole thing was assigned, but I read a lot of it. Uh, and I really like this book, and I know it sounds strange to say you liked a textbook on phonetics and phonology, but when I was in the course, I just felt so overwhelmed. Like the professor would be talking about a lot of things in the lecture, and I was not understanding most of it, and I just thought, ah, oh, geez, I'm gonna fail this course. I spent all this money on this uh, program. Uh, uh, what you know, I have to stay here an extra semester. I was just stressed about it. But then I would open up this book and do the readings, and I could understand this perfectly. Uh, Peter Roach just writes in such a kind of a clear style that's so easy to read and so easy to understand. I mean, it is a textbook, so it's not inherently interesting. Yeah, like, I wouldn't take this to the beach to read or something like that. Um, but, you know, it gets the job done. It's a very kind of clear and concise and easy to read explanation of the concepts you need to understand basic 
English phonetics and phonology. So because of that, um, oh yeah, another thing as well. There are exercises in the back. Uh, and the first week I, I was in the course, I actually made an effort to try and do all the exercises in the back. I think uh, some of these chapters I even have kind of check marks by the exercises I completed. Um, because I felt that that did kind of help me to kind of understand everything. But um, it takes a while to do all the exercises in the back and go back and check them. Uh, so, you know, time management again. I just didn't have time to do all the exercises in the back and check them. But I thought to myself, after the course finishes, I thought, you know, I'm going to take this book and I'm going to keep it with me and I'm going to read it cover to cover one of these days and just kind of finally understand all about English phonetics and phonology because I felt like so much of that course went right over my head. Uh, and uh, yeah, now it's eight years later and I'm just getting around to it now. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's not a difficult book to read, but it's not the kind of thing you grab off the shelf when you're going to the beach. Um, but I did, I've, I've kept this book with me for like uh, the past eight years, and that's something of an accomplishment because I've moved countries a number of times. Went from Australia back to the US, went from the US to Cambodia, went from Cambodia to Vietnam. And every time you move countries, you've got to get rid of all your books. Like you just can't take a suitcase full of books on the plane. Like they weigh like a ton. Uh, you're way over the weight limit. So you can take like, I don't know, three or four books every time you move countries. So every time I move countries, I have to give away all my books, throw them away, I don't know. Um, and this was one of the f few handfuls of books I just managed to save with me through all those moves. Um, so I was kind of always intending to get around to it. And I've uh, finally gotten around to it this year. The reason I got around to it now specifically is because this book is also recommended reading for the Delta. Uh, Cambridge publishes a list of books that's kind of recommended reading for Delta Module 1. This is one of the books on their list. I think it's also recommended for Delta Module 2. And we've got a book club at my work. I uh, work as an English language teacher at an English language school. Uh, we've got a book club for professional development in which we kind of choose a book off the Delta reading list because a lot of us are either doing the Delta or have plans to do the Delta or something like that. Uh, so we, every month we choose a new book from that Delta reading list. And this book was on the Delta reading list. I didn't actually suggest it. Somebody else suggested it. But I thought to myself, ah, perfect. I've got a copy at home. So I don't even need to kind of uh, go to the store and, and make a photocopy. We, we usually make photocopies because all the books are kind of electronically on the school's uh, electronic library. Um, there was a slight... Yeah, so I, I already had this book at home and I thought, perfect, I've been meaning to get around to this for years now. Um, the, uh, yeah, there's a few different editions floating around. This is the fourth edition. Uh, the school library, the electronic version was the second edition. The print version, which was on the, the shelves in our school library, was the third edition. Uh, somebody grabbed the print edition off the, the library shelf. The other people got photocopies made from the electronic version. So we were reading the second, third, and the fourth edition, which meant when we met up for the book club, we had all read kind of different editions. Uh, as far as I can tell, we never like did a line by line comparison. So take this with a grain of salt. But as far as I can tell, there is no substantial difference between the second, third, and fourth editions. We all kind of tend, we all agreed we had kind of read some of the same content. The problem, of course, was page numbers. Uh, we were discussing stuff, and I'd be like, no, 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 it's on page uh, 107. He talks about intonation there. And then it would be a completely different page in the second edition or the third edition. 
I could be wrong, but uh, I read an article on the internet. I, it was on cracked.com about the, you know, the textbook business. And apparently they routinely just published new editions where they just rearrange the content to different pages just to kind of get people to buy new textbooks instead of using used textbooks when they go to university. Bit of a scam that way. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's some new material in here as well. I shouldn't be making accusations because I never did a thorough line by line comparison. So I, sh I shouldn't be saying this, but uh, it's a suspicion maybe. I suspect that some of these new additions are just kind of uh, rearranging content with different page numbers. Anyways, uh, so we, uh, we had this book for the book club and we agreed we were gonna meet up. We usually take a month for it. I think we gave it five weeks because somebody was out of the country. Uh, and I kind of set off with this book and I thought, okay, now this time I'm gonna read the whole thing. I'm gonna do all the exercises and I'm gonna finally understand this once and for all because it's kind of been plaguing me a little bit that I never really kind of got my head fully wrapped around about English phonetics and phonology. The difficult thing though with doing the exercises in the back, uh, where there are exercises at the end of each chapter, the answers are in the back. The difficulty with doing this is it takes time. You know, so if you're just kind of uh, sitting reading during your lunch break, it's a little bit of a pain in the neck to take out a pencil and paper and go through the written exercises. Um, but I made an effort. I would go to coffee shops with a pencil and paper, pen and paper, and go through the exercises and check my answers in the back. Uh, and then if I got anything wrong, and especially with the phonetic script, I would tend to get a lot of stuff wrong, uh, especially the vowels. I have difficulty remembering which vowels are which in the phonetic script. Uh, then I would kind of redo it until I got it right and just practice, practice, practice. And that lasted for about I think four, five chapters. Um, no, no, wait, sorry, I'm looking at this. Actually, I, I made it through six chapters. The first six chapters I did the written exercises. And then like a month had gone by and I was only on chapter six and we were supposed to meet. Um, and we ended up pushing the, the meeting time back by a couple weeks because nobody was done with the book. But at that point, I just, um, yeah, gave up doing the written exercises and just read the book. So I, I've, I didn't do the written exercises, but I did, I did read kind of all the content of the book. There's also, in addition to the written exercises, there are listening exercises. So you, uh, you know, because it's a book on phonetics and phonology, so there's a listening component. You uh, listen to it and you kind of identify what phonemes you're hearing or what intonations you're hearing and then the uh, answers are on the back. So these are the answers to the written exercises and these are the answers to the recorded exercises. Um, Yep, so you, you, you can do the recorded exercises as well, chapter by chapter, and uh, check your answers in the back. I, I thought I intended to do this, but I never got around to doing it. Uh, because, like, this is really... I mean, you've got to be sitting at home to do this, to kind of set up, listen to the CD and kind of play it back. I was always kind of reading this book in coffee shops and on my lunch break at work. So I always thought, okay, I'll just, I'll do the listening exercises later. I can't do it while I'm in the coffee shop. But then once I gave up on the written exercises, I gave up on the listening exercises as well. You know, I had the best of intentions of kind of working through all the exercises in this book, uh, but I just didn't have the time. It occurs to me though, who does all the exercises? Probably nobody, right? Nope, I mean, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, nobody does all the exercises, right? All the written exercises and all the listening exercises. Uh, probably they know that when they're writing the book, huh? They know nobody is going to do these exercises. 
but they include the CD anyways. Maybe that's just another scam to uh, get the price of this textbook up. I don't know. Oh, or I don't know. Let, let me know if you've actually done all the, the exercises. Uh, I think, I don't know. I, I'm aware, I'm increasingly aware that a lot of people studying English phonetics and phonology are non-native speakers. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of English teachers throughout the world are actually non-native speakers, like Vietnamese people teaching English to other Vietnamese people or Japanese people teaching English to other Japanese people. And this is a standard university textbook in a lot of these universities around the world. Uh, so maybe the CD actually helps out for those people. Um, I probably could have learned something if I actually done it, but I don't know. There's so many exercises here. Uh, no time. I did read the whole thing. So, um, although I'm f flipping through it now, I finished it about a week and a half ago. I read the thing over the course of five weeks. I was reviewing it right before I turned the camera on for this video review. I'm embarrassed to say kind of how much stuff I don't actively remember. Like receptively as I'm flipping through the chapters, I'm like, oh, that's right, I remember reading that. That's right, I remember reading that. But if I were to close the book and just kind of talk at the, you know, just kind of produce actively the knowledge without looking at the book, uh, yeah, it's very difficult to remember all this stuff. But then that, I guess that's true of every textbook, isn't it? Uh, I, I always feel a little bit frustrated with phonetics and phonology because I've been over this so many times. In fact, another book I reviewed on this very YouTube channel, I'll put the link down below, was Sound Foundations by Adrian Underhill, which is another book on English pronunciation. Uh, and I read it and I... I I think I made the same complaints I'm making now about how I have so much trouble remembering the phonetic script for the vowels, even though I've been over this so many times. We were at our book club meeting, though, and somebody asked me, they said, uh, I was complaining about how I've, I've gone over phonetics and phonology so many times I just never seem to remember it. Uh, and somebody said, but it gets a little bit easier each time, doesn't it? And I thought, I thought, yeah, it does a bit. I mean, every time I get, get a, a little bit better handle on those vowels, every time I understand intonation patterns a little bit more, it's a little bit less intimidating. I think, you know, a lot of things with the intonation, like the head, the pre-head and the head and the n nuclear tonic syllable and the tail and all the terminology used to really intimidate me. I think the first course I, I took on this. Uh, when I was reading through the book this time, it was kind of just like kind of seeing kind of familiar things. It was like, oh, okay, I know this. So just kind of, it is, it is coming a little bit. Yeah, even though, yeah, even though I'm, obviously this isn't, it's not clicking as fast as it should have. Like this is not, my natural field, I think. Um, it's something I have to struggle with. But anyways, um, people in the book club enjoyed this book for the most part. I think there was one, one girl who, <laughs> I think I annoyed her a little bit because we were talking about the book. Uh, with, this was before we had finished it, kind of just chatting in the office. And I said, you know, it's not the most interesting book in the world, but it's clear the explanations are easy to understand. I feel like I'm tracking with it while I'm reading it. So, like, I like that about that. And uh, I, th I think she was, she was not having the same experience. I think she was struggling with it a little bit. Because I overheard her saying to somebody, Ugh, this Joel, he's going on about how he can understand everything in the book and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, yeah, she, 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 I think she was struggling with it and would have appreciated more sympathy. Um, yes, although, um, 
I shouldn't give myself too much credit because as I've been saying, this is kind of my second time through the book. And I've also read other books on um, English pronunciation and phonology and stuff like that. Sorry, I'm rambling. Uh, let me see if I can say anything kind of concrete about this book. In addition to being kind of easy to understand and uh, clear and concise explanations, one thing I found interesting about this book is, you, you know, some of these books you read them and they say, okay, these are the rules. This, this is the way English pronunciation works. What I liked about Peter Roach is he says, okay, these are the areas of disagreement. These are the things people are debating right now. And there's a school that says this, and there's a school that says this. And then he'll, he'll give like, these are the reasons to think this, and these are the reasons to think the opposite. Each chapter has like a uh, notes on problems and further reading. Uh, and in some of these, it differs from chapter to chapter, but in some of these, he really gets into it. Like, um, what was a good one? I think the, uh, there's, a, there's a symbol in the phonetic symbol, it's, uh, in the phonetic alphabet, it, it's like in with a little tail kind of going underneath it. Uh, and it's used um, for the ing sound in English, like in sing, that ing sound, which um, traditionally uh, is thought to be like a separate phoneme in English. Like even though we don't have a letter of the alphabet for it, we have to write two letters that in G together. It is kind of being thought of as like one sound that's part of the sound inventory in English. And this is the way it's usually taught. He mentions the controversy about whether ing is just another version of in. Uh, that pops up in different contexts. Um, yeah, can I explain this without getting into all the background? <sighs> maybe not. He, call, he, he calls it, he says maybe ing is an elephone of in. Now an elephone is like uh, when there's a, a phonemes that alternate with each other in predictable situations. Or, no, that's not what it is at all. All right, let me give you an example. Actually, you know what? Scratch that. I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to say that he gets into this whole controversy of whether ing is a separate phoneme in English or whether it's just a different version of in. Um, and uh, goes through all the reasons back and forth on both sides. And it's just kind of really interesting that he's kind of exploring these controversies instead of saying, this is the way it is. Even though it's like an introductory course, it's just kind of, yeah. It's, it's interesting to kind of see there's so much ambiguity. And in fact, like in the previous books I'd read on phonetics, I always was a little bit, I, that always kind of used to bug me. I thought, well, how do they know all this so precisely? Uh, and Peter Roach gets into it and he's like, well, you know, they don't know this. Nobody knows this. This is something that they're still trying to figure out how to research. Uh, and yeah, phonetics and phonology, it's something I've always struggled with, but it, aspects of it can be interesting. What always interests me is kind of finding out that the sounds that you actually make are completely different than the sounds you think you're making. Um, this is, yeah, this is something you learn as you're an English teacher, just kind of, because native speakers, I guess, don't really, unless they're studying linguistics, they don't really think too much about the sounds they're actually making. So like a classic example, uh, the ED, the, you know, the past tense ending, right? So you, you have, uh, um... The, so jump changes to jumped or walk changes to walked. And this is no, something I never realized before I started teaching English. I think most people don't realize it before they start teaching English. Uh, you're not actually pronouncing the ed sound. You're, con you're pronouncing a t sound. Uh, there's no e in there at all. And the d changes to a t 
when it's next to an unvoiced consonant. Uh, so you don't say walked or jumped, you say walked and jumped. Now that's, that's a very basic example. Uh, but there's just tons of this stuff in here where like the sounds you think that you're, you, you know, the, the words that you think you've been saying your whole life, you're not actually saying them at all like you think you're saying them. Uh, one example he had in here which I thought was interesting uh, is there's like voiced and unvoiced consonants. So there's like a t sound and there's a d sound, which is made, the d sound and the t sound is made in your mouth the same way but the vocal cords are vibrating on the D and they're not on the T. But what's also interesting, and, and this I didn't, I don't think I fully realized it until I realized it I was reading this book. There's also the aspiration. So when you're saying T, you're like T, like there's air coming out with a T. When you're saying D, there's not that aspirated, there's not air coming out. Uh, and English speakers listening will recognize a T sound not from the voicing but from the aspiration. Uh, and in fact, in certain contexts, the T or the, the D can get devoiced uh, when it's kind of near uh, another unvoiced, when it's near unvoiced uh, letters, uh, uh, consonants. Um, and in that case, we recognize it as a D be because of the aspiration uh, or lack thereof. But then he was saying if you have an S sound in front of the T, then there's no aspiration there. So like, uh, or I think the, he gives the example of P and B. So if you have an S P, then the P loses its aspiration when you put it with an S. Um, but English speakers, and if, he says if you were to go into like a laboratory and get out the recording equipment and kind of clip off that S and uh, just play the P for uh, a native English speaker to listen, they'd identify it as a B sound because it's has, it doesn't have the aspiration there. But if you put the S back on it and play this, the whole word, then they hear it as a P sound. <sighs> Sorry, that's me rambling. That's just kind of one of many things in this book that took a little bit for me to get into. You know, like I, I had to kind of read it a little bit kind of slowly and carefully to kind of follow his argument. And if you're listening to me on this video, I probably just made a mess of it where it was impossible to understand what I'm talking about. But he explains it much better in the book. Um, so those kind of things were interesting, kind of once you got into them. Um, yeah, what else to say about this book? I should have said this maybe at the top of the review, but uh, as an American, kind of one of the irritations of this book is the whole thing is based on the BBC accent, which, you know, I don't like it because it's not my accent. Uh, no, actually, like, I like British accents. You know, when you hear them on TV, it always sounds so cool and crisp and kind of intelligent. But it does mean when you're reading a book, uh, especially the vowel sounds, which have always kind of given me so much trouble remembering the symbol for the vowel sounds, it's that much more difficult because they're all different symbols in my accent. And then the whole R thing, you know, like, because there's no R uh, there's no R at the end of words in the British accent. It changes the vowel sound, makes it more difficult for someone with an American accent to understand it. Anyway, my 30 minutes is up and it's just as well. I've been kind of rambling incoherently this whole time. I'll just sign off here. <laughs>